National Symposium. I invite uh, uh, Dr. Anis Sridhar, Dr. Mugesh Sharma, Dr. Vigas Menon, and Dr. Fairos to be on the dais. I do. Is uh, the chairman of Department of Ophthalmology at Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, and Vision Eye Center in Delhi. Uh, he's been training and teaching a lot of us for so many years. It is always a pleasure to listen to his uh, detailed, experienced uh, talks. Please. Thank you for this opportunity to talk in the National Symposium, Fedus and Vikas and Mariam. I'm going to talk about the plastic reconstruction of the medial canthus in traumatic and congenital anomalies. As we know, the medial canthal tendon is important and it has two heads the deep head and the superficial one and the deep head has a greater impact on the position of the medial canthus an anterior limb avulsion is one of the common traumatic abnormalities and it's much easier to handle when the posterior part is intact you can just put back the anterior structures and it works well the posterior structures when they are affected either avulsed or broken then they need to be reconstructed because there can be a greater impact on the position of the medial canthus here you can see along with the canalicular tear there is this break of the posterior crust and it is being repaired here with a proline suture 40 proline suture in fact being a permanent suture we are putting it back by a double arm suture now at other times when it's not possible to repair the two limbs you may need to combine it with a microplating uh, procedure in some cases so this is an example of a medial canthal injury avulsion with the again a canalicular tear another example of a medial canthal avulsion where the medial canthus has to be reattached and the skin defect taken care of by appropriate procedure <clears throat> now when the um, defects become older there are traumatic deformities that take place downward and outward displacement of the canthus is very common very often they are due to the soft tissue abnormalities and at other times it's because of the underlying naso orbito ethmoid fractures the soft tissue deformities may require a variety of different techniques to tackle them but the basic principle remains that you want to create a posterior fixation which is behind the sac at the posterior lacrimal crest and getting a good firm apposition to that structure is usually important so here we have through a incision exposed the area behind the sac this is the area of the posterior lacrimal crest where a bite with a proline suture has been taken and then it is taken through the a firm part of the medial canthal tendon and when it is tightened you tend to get the right position of the medial canthus an example is this patient with a traumatic telecanthus where we have used a skin incision in order to do a yv plasty and gone through the transcaruncular incision to create a fixation you can combine the two at times and then fixate the uh, medial canthal tendon to the posterior lacrimal crest and you can manage to get a good correction when there is an associated downward displacement you usually have already lost the canalicular system and in these cases you can transposition the lens by using a z plasty so a z plasty with the lower limb containing the medial canthus is then transformed but it requires a lot of management of the soft tissue in this region and a very good fixation of the medial canthus to the bony structure and in the region of the posterior lacrimal crest in order to get a good uh, reconstruction a lot of scarring in this re region precludes a perfect result but you can try and improve it to the best possible another example of a scalp deformity along with uh, a brow deformity and a ptosis and a telecanthus the medial canthus is superficially placed and displaced so we 
uh, revise the brow scar and at the same time by excision of the scar tissue and resuturing reposition the medial canthus by a medial canthal plating and we were able to restore back the position of the brow and ptosis was then to be corrected separately bony deformities require either transnasal wiring but more often low profile mini plates of small two to four holes you can use the t-shaped ones and short screws drilled superficially in that region are needed you need to have a good exposure and a headlight in order to see in that area well so this is an example let's look at the video of uh, placement of a micro plate for correction of the telecanthus the scar tissue in that region needs to be handled. So after the dissection and exposure of the posterior lacrimal crest region, if you use a microplate with two holes, you can use one to pass the suture before you do put the screw into the position. Ensure a good fixation. Ensure that this is in line with the medial canthus. And then take a bite through a firm part of the uh, medial canthal tendon and then do a closure with a firm permanent suture like proline and then you can do the soft tissue closure but when you do this closure it is important to take a bite which is uh, closer to the medial end deeper also in order to ensure that the um, canthus moves towards the medial part so that deeper bite with this uh, double arm suture is important and then excess skin tissue is removed and you can do a simple closure so this can give you a good correction of the telecanthus improve the position significantly before you can undertake the next stage work um, this child had a loss of vision in one eye because of injury to the optic nerve also had bilateral in nasoorbitoethmoid fractures causing telecanthus at the same time it caused a nasolacrimal duct obstruction so we worked with the plastic surgeons to with a bicoronal approach did an open sky dactrocystorhinostomy and a transnasal wiring and she's been got rid of her um, dactrocystitis and she has a better much better position of the medial canthus so this restores the aesthetics she's later had a squint surgery done for her right eye for the congenital ones um, the telecanthus that we see most often is in blepharophimosis syndrome we are all aware of the components the horizontal component may be mild moderate or severe for the milder cases you are able to do a simple procedure like uh, uh, the tightening of the medial canthus or tucking but in more severe cases you need a more extensive procedure like transnasal wiring y to v plasty is now my go to procedure i did some c plasties initially and even before that did some double z plasties but the scars were more prominent uh, when mustardi came some 25 years ago he wanted my picture of c plasty to say that the scars of c are worse than my y to v double z plasty he took that slide away from me it was chrome slides was a proud position at, at the, to those times so c plasty he he condemned so and then second stage you can do a bilateral fascia lata sling surgeries milder cases may be done in a single stage but more often the procedure needs to be performed in two stages because you don't want to do a horizontal and vertical stretching at the same time so this is an example of a relatively milder case done as a single stage procedure pre-op and post-op however most cases are done as two-stage procedure mpl tightening alone um, we need to look at whether the procedure corrects telecanthus well does it give a good depth and does the effect last long so this was a moderate telecanthus where we did a y to v plasty with mpl tucking and we could get a reasonable correction but it, uh, it leaves a lot to be desired so what do we do for these cases which are as severe as this so transnasal wiring is the go to procedure in these cases so good nasal packing is important in order to get less 
bleeding when we make our windows do a marking in in a way that you are correcting the intermedial canthal distance to the half of the interpupillary distance <clears throat> mark your limbs of the y do a good dissection to expose the anterior lacrimal crest and the medial palpable ligament then you give an incision with the cautery at the anterior lacrimal crest to lift the periosteum and the lacrimal fascia and then make a bony window in line with the medial canthus on both the sides to this window you don't that much need to bother about protecting the mucosa but of course you want to minimize the bleeding where the palpable fissure is really small you want to do a lateral canthoplasty as well but in many cases i avoid it because a good contour a good angulation of the lateral canthus is very important the wiring is done by using a needle with a, um, a bent needle to uh, pass the stainless steel wire and then once it has been passed at one end then a fascia latta needle picks up the the threads to the other side where again an anchorage is done by a railroad procedure through the medial canthal tendon on the other side and then the tightening is done in a manner that it gives a good correction i'll take another minute to just uh, show the results now this is what it looks like at the end of the procedure and um, the results can be quite good the important thing is that you get a good telecanthus correction as in all these examples and a deeply placed medial canthus which we will look at so uh, look at the appearance of the depth of the medial canthus here and the depth that we are able to achieve with this as we see here and uh, another example of the kind of depth that you are able to give to the medial canthus in these patients and the effect does last this is a one year post operative patient and this is the last example a four years female with severe blepharophimosis with ectropion who's had some skin grafting done earlier she had also had a temporary suture sling done earlier but when she presented to us we did a yv plasty with transnasal wiring in august 2004 and then uh, fascia latta sling surgery 6 months later in the same girl and this is the same girl after 12 years and now she looks good we didn't do a good job from the post op early post op you can see but she does look good after 12 and 13 years with good depth and good correction of ptosis so the effect of transnasal wiring does last for a long time and you get a good correction of ptosis so in our cases we been able to get a very good horizontal correction although the vertical correction is limited by the kind of structures we have um, so um, transnasal wiring is a good procedure for most of these cases 63 of our 75 cases we have done a transnasal wiring thank you very much again that was really excellent sir some really complicated cases and uh, complicated procedures Uh, definitely uh, not a easy job to do but you made it look simple that is uh, the hallmark of an expert uh, sir a few questions uh, one thing uh, do you do prophylactic uh, intubation of the canaliculi while operating on the medial um, canthi wherein then i feel that the um, concern is exaggerated because the bite that, that we take is uh, through the medial canthal tendon at a part fairly close to the um um uh, lateral end, i mean fairly laterally and uh, the canaliculi are fairly deep there is an early kinking they get a bit of watering in the early post operative period but of the 75 cases have not had one persistent epiphora so i don't think that concern is really much justified we don't do any uh, intubation it's just the kinking that is taking place okay sir and recently we've uh, also started uh, doing these mini plates using mini plates on for correction of telecanthus acquired telecanthus cases uh, dr ganga is there who probably brought uh, this to our uh, who taught us this technique first time uh, so comparing to transnasal wiring how would you rate a bilateral for the unilateral cases i think it is uh, best to do a 
mini uh, play mini play but for and a bilateral situation you bilateral um, trans- again transnasal wiring works well so but for bilateral cases i would do a transnasal wiring okay you know when we are doing this transnasal wiring we are actually sh- physically shifting the the tissues into the nasal cavity and the knot of the stainless steel wire is also buried into the nasal cavity so you are able to get a very good result as you saw in that girl with a trauma mm, yes sir you can get a really satisfying result in those these bilateral cases but for unilateral it seems a bit um, extra to do the thing bilaterally and do a transnasal wiring for them my the mini plate works very well sorry i'm asking too many questions probably Welcome. okay uh, i have few more i'll ask uh, any other uh, questions or comments from the audience no it's not really necessary to remove the anterior leg i'll just i'm just starting the dissection from that area it is in line with where you want it is to be relatively posterior window because you want the posterior shift of the medial canthus is not coming to anteriorly no we are just starting the lift off of the medial canthal tendon and the um, periosteum from the anterior lacrimal crest incision you are not taking the window bone anterior. window is in the posterior lacrimal crest yes. deep to the posterior lacrimal crest up to the posterior lacrimal crest it is a relatively posterior window but it has to be a large window because as i said the objective is to shift the medial canthal tissue is there and you also have to remove some of the the bulking debulking is also needed in these cases debulking of yeah medial canthal okay. tendon is also yes, multi- yes. very long in these uh, m- many of these you can see that it is abnormal thin and long but it gets shifted you need have to have a f- good firm bite on both the sides and it just gets pulled off into the uh, nasal region thank you so much sir any other question or comment for dr grover we were using a much thicker wire earlier 26 or something is uh, quite all right 26 28 it need not be very thick because the manipulation becomes more difficult with 24 we have fortunately being a general hospital we get it easily for all the gauges so it's quite easy works well it's not difficult as it is made out to be it's a much easier procedure all procedures that you are doing in any case and the wind- window you are making every day and here you are not even concerned about if mucosa gets opened up or something and you just have to pull it to the other side it's a very simple procedure only protecting the globe that when you pull it and it passes very easily there's not much resistance through the nasal septum with our fascia lata needle it's a fairly simple procedure thank you very much sir so uh, next uh, next is uh, uh, dr gangadhar sundar orbital trauma uh, aos at the rate of uh, aos orbit yeah. thank you uh, uh, for, for the kind invitation it is a pleasure to be back in india nooks and corners enjoying hospitality culture food so on so forth always end up going back gaining some weight and struggle to take it off after the meetings uh the title of the presentation is that and no it's not a typo so how many of you what is the second ao i was i'm going to talk about so we all familiar with the first ao is on the left which is of course you're all members of it what i'm going to talk about is the angle of the inferomedial orbital strut an anatomical entity which i think is very important that we recognize as orbital surgeons especially if we're doing reconstructive surgery dr grover gave a beautiful talk of telecanthus correction intercanthal wiring and when you do only blepharophimosis it is quite challenging but when you're doing enough trauma work and you're managing that segment of fractures which are noe fractures which also involves a lot of intercanthal wiring then you become more familiar with it so more familiar we do things it makes it much easier so this is a trauma thing to the intercanthal wiring that he was talking about whether it's unilateral or bilateral telecanthus these are my disclosures and some publications and books where we outline the practical classification of orbital fractures remember there are orbital fractures pure orbital fractures only conform to about 20 25% of all the orbital fractures 75% of them are orbitofacial fractures as you can see in the column right and the pure orbital fractures that small segment of the two wall fractures the combined flow medial wall fractures which is again one of the most challenging things for us to reconstruct is what i'm going to talk about today 
So if you look at the applied anatomy of the orbit, there are external buttresses, there are internal buttresses in the inferomedial orbital strut. That strut of bone ju junction of the floor and the medial wall is very important for the orbital structural support. Because if you have excessive decompression or dis destruction of the inframedial orbital strut, the entire orbital contents shift and has significant consequences. That is important and there's an angle that is formed between the two, the floor and the medial wall. And that's what we're going to talk about in addition to the additional landmarks. I think Raghuraj Hegdev presented this as ASOP press several, several years ago. We, we measured the angle of the floor and the medial wall, anterior, mid, and posterior orbit, and came up with this AOS, which almost always is present in unilateral fractures. We measure the contralateral normal angle, pre-bend the plates to the, appropriate, uh, op to the opposite side. There way you avoid a lot of intraorbital manipulation and maneuvering of these implants, and delivering very good results. And why is that important? We see fractures like these reconstructed elsewhere, where you can see orbits being reconstructed any which way you want. You may see it as a pure floor fracture, but there's a floor on the medial wall fracture. The medial wall is being completely ignored. Yet another example of a combined floor medial wall fracture, where the medial component and the strut has been ignored, and the medial part of the plate is in the sinuses. The case of a panfacial fracture, this is where I'm guilty of doing this, where we manage to get the upper craniofacial skeleton right, mid-face right, even the mandibular fracture fixed. But you can see the implant on the right, the rap rapid sorb implant that you can see over there, we have not adequately reconstructed the floor and the medial wall junction, ignoring the AIOS, which results in clinical consequences like you see over here. And Dr. Shalu was asking some of the questions about post, you think you've done a good reconstruction, sometimes we still see enough thermos, why does that happen? Even a grossly reasonably reconstructed orbit is still not anatomically well reconstructed. That's why it's important for you to critically look at the preoperative scans of these patients, look at it in the axial, coronal, and sagittal view. Axial gives you certain dimensions. Coronal gives you generally a good picture, one viewed from all the way from the front to the back up to the optic canal. And the sagittal is very important to identify the posterior ledge. And these are all things that you help formulate a decision, how aggressive you're going to be, what incisions you're going to make, what are the walls you're going to reconstruct. And our practical approach to uh, managing fractures, every fracture, once you decide to go in, every wall should be addressed, not ignoring, oh, the medial wall is nothing not important uh, to be taken care of. Look at it both from the soft tissue windows, which you are familiar with, but a lot of times we ignore the bone windows, which is also very important. So that star that you can see over here is a junction of the floor and medial wall, and that's the orbital strut we're talking about. Especially if you're doing compressive uh, orbital decompression procedures, sometimes we are too radical about destroying that in a patient where we're doing cosmetic decompression when you cause globe, globe dystopias. And the same thing, that's what happens in trauma when there's disruption of the orbital strut. And that angle I've shown over here, which can be measured, and I started off using this with using a protractor from my son's geometry box. Looking at a scan, putting it up over there, we demonstrated that at Seema's uh, Shroff Center. And that's what we had. And I think immediately these guys came up with overnight a goniometer. Down the street, there was these surgical companies. We have these goniometers, which are sold to the spine surgeons and the hand surgeons to measure the angle deformities. And soon enough, we started using the goniometer to measure these angles. With the electronic pack system, you can now measure the angle using a software, which is available as well. You want to look at it in the sagittal aspect as well to identify the posterior edge. Remember, the floor is not a straight line, but an S-curve. And if you ignore the S-curve, also results in enough thermos. So the anatomical prefabricated plates became very popular because of that particular aspect, the angle between the floor and the medial wall, but comes in one particular angle based on about 100 scans done on German orbits. But you and I know that every single patient is every, very different. Even the same size, shape, cataract patient does not have the same IOL power. And we do biometry, right? So likewise, I think we believe in measuring the angles of every single patient, pre-bending these implants based on the goniometer, which is seen over here, so that in a way, this pre-bent, prefabricated implant is a rudimentary form of a patient-specific implant. So you don't need to go for high-end patient-specific implants when you actually have a stock implant, which you can pre-bend to that patient's particular anatomy. Here's a video, if it plays. Uh, we have a goniometer. We have measured the angle of the anterior, mid, and the posterior angle. Can you play the video, please? Or do I have control? Yeah, OK. Yeah, OK, I'll play it. Okay. This is probably Raghuraj, I think he was there uh, when we just started doing these things, where you can measure the anterior part of the plate, the middle part of the plate, and the posterior part of the plate, and you can measure it to that particular angle we measure on the uh, biorosol implant, on the, on the goniometer. And then there's no more intraoperative guesses. 
And with this pre-bending of implant, you no longer need to do even a retrocurrencular medial transconjunctal incision. You can just go with the swinging eyelid incision alone to go ahead, expose the floor, posterior ledge, then onto the medial wall, reduce the contents, slide this implant to place. If you have intraoperative endoscopy, you can do that. Navigation, if you want to do that, and then you can go ahead and do that. Once we started getting an anatomical uh, pre-bent implants right, and uh, you know very well, a lot of these patients do not have recurrent trauma. If it's a one-off injury, we tend to use bioresorbable implants. So in these situations, what we started doing was pre-bending the pre-bent anatomical prefabricated plate to that AIOS that we described. Then we started using these thermolobile bioresorbable implants. You heat the water bath to about 6065, and these are polylactide implants, which can be conformed to your pre-bent prefabricated plate. And you can get a bioresorbable implant like that. So that way you have the floor component, there's a medial wall component, and the strut component to this implant, which is now what goes into as well. And we'll show you some examples of good results of this. So this has necessitated or negated the need for medial transconjunctival incisions. We started off with big, large incisions, disinserted in the floor oblique, which causes torsional diplopia. We started off with two separate incisions, and now it's just a pure inferior swinging eyelid incision. Go along the floor, posterior ledge, go along the medial wall, reduce the contents. Go, if you have navigation, you can do a navigation. Where's Dr. Usha Kim? Navigation. <laughs> She's a believer now. We, we had almost a fisticuff yesterday on the cruise. And I relented. In relation to the debate that they had yesterday in the cruise, okay. <laughs> so you can identify and navigate, make sure you have reduced where you want to reduce it. Then we swing these implants inside. And once you place it in place, we again, we do interoperative navigation. And that's the kind of result you can get. You no longer have to dread and fear and do guesswork in terms of placing floor, medial wall, implants, all through a transconjunctal approach. That was an anatomical prefabricated plate. This is an example of a patient where we have used a bioresorbable plate. You can see a disruption of the floor, medial wall, disruption of the angle, pre-bend these implants. This is the same patient 18 months later where the bone is remodeled and healed the bioresorbable implant is completely healed and gone, so you're not left with long-term consequences of plates and screws as well, and the same patient as well. Uh, so we're talking about post-traumatic gain of thalamus, I always believe that anatomical reconstruction, which means accurate reconstruction, is what the major factor, in addition to a traumatic dissection of the orbital contents, which is important. You have to intervene in these patients, ideally within a couple of weeks, some people call it early, some people call it late. I think two weeks is a reasonable orbit, uh, timing for uh, you know, internal orbital fracture repairs as well. Just pure transconjunctival incisions is enough. We don't longer need to do retrocurrent incision. You no longer need to do inferior oblique detachment. You can use permanent implants, bioresorbent implants, whatever you want. This is the implant of choice for patients who have a recurrent trauma. And I do not use porous polyethylene implants anymore because of chronic infections. And I think I will stop right there, yeah. So in summary, uh, try to drive home an anatomical concept of the angle of the inframedial orbital strut. Measure that on your patients, on your scans. Don't look at the reports. You can measure them on your electronic system and reconstruct these orbits very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gangadhar. Very inspiring as always. And uh, over the years, Dr. Gangadhar has been delivering various lectures and courses in India and has really changed the way we used to look at fractures and the way we treat these fracture patients nowadays and uh, that has taken the game to an entirely different level. Thank you. So uh, one query I had Dr. Gangadhar one that uh, you showed these bioresorbable implants which are molded over the standard plates. Now these are uh, typically large fractures where you have this strut uh, damage done. So you use, you use these bioresorbable implants uh, only for pediatric patients or even for adult patients you have used these patients. So I think by default now 60% of the orbital fracture reconstructions we do using bioresorbables, even in adults. So in adults, how do we stratify? If this is a motorcyclist, a grab delivery driver, for example, who gets involved in road traffic accidents all the time, or people are in uh, Muay Thai boxing and all these contact sports, they're going to be injured again. So for them, I tend to use permanent implants. For all the other accidental trip and fall and random injuries where you like less likely to see these patients again and again, with another fracture, we tend to use bioresorbable implants. I think that has been a recent uh, transition. Yes, and we've been doing this for since what, 2004, almost what, 18, 19 years. And there's been an evolution of bioresorbables. These new thermolabile lactic acid implants are low inflammation activity, can be bent, 
to the S contour along the floor if you want, the angle that you want medially, they maintain their shape intraorbitally until the 12, 15 months it takes for them to absorb, by which time your own bones heal up very well. So, which implant is this one? What does it come by? No conflict of instruct. This is from the uh, J, now called J&J. In the past, it was a Synthes. Before that, it was Mathis. This generation of companies taken over. They are the ones. It's a 70-30 combination of polylactide implants. It's, I mean, what is the greatest thing that has happened in strabismus surgery? What made strabismus surgery much easier? Vicral sutures, bioresorbable sutures. So we are not new to bioresorbables at all. It's just a mindset that is required to switch to bioresorbable implants. Uh, between a standard titanium plate, it's about a, uh, one and a half times. But I think it's well worth the cost because you don't have to go back and worry about these implants. And one of the U European Union regulations is if you put a permanent implant in a patient, you have to follow them up for life because you can have long-term uh, complications, in which we do sometimes, loose screws and so on and so forth. So these also avoids a long-term follow-up cost. And I think the cost, in my opinion, cost in medicine always is justified one way or the other for the prime benefit of the patient. And have you ever got a situation where after the resorption of the implant, the enophthalmos has to some extent come back? That has been report, uh, reported, and that's where the choice of the bioresorbable implant is very important. What I showed you was a polylactide, no vested interest in the company. Then there are another type of implant, for example, the osteopore implant or the polycaprol implant, which is far more supple. So if you use it for a large defect and is not a thick enough implant but a thin enough implant, that kind of buckles within the orbit, then the he bone heals along that. And you will see some of these papers written gloriously. They don't even mention the name of the material and that causes the bioresorbables a bad name. So that's why the stiffer implant for large fractures is good, but if you have a supple implant, and I think polycaprolactone is available, it was made in Singapore implant, I tend to use it for smaller fractures, not for medium or large fractures. Thank you very much. Okay, any you much. any other questions? Uh, Age groups, implant of choice for pediatric patients, and there's no adult patient, there's no contraindication, it's not, they're not likely to be injured again and again. Uh, you can use it in any age, no issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank Ganga. You. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Ganga. The, in the interest of time, we'll move to the next topic. Um, Periocular aesthetic surgery by Dr. Melin Naik. Yeah, good morning. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank AIOS, Fairuz, and uh, Dr. Partha for involving me in this national symposium. So my job is to talk about periocular aesthetic procedures and I see a lot of oculoplastic surgeons in the audience and this is just going to be a revision of some of the basic periocular proce procedures. So just for those who are not oculoplastic surgeons, just very simple uh, statistics that each patient has only two cataracts but they have four eyelids and multiple wrinkles and cosmetic concerns. So it's always a lucrative field to get into, especially in the periocular region. As we do more and more of laser refractive surgery, these patients tend to become more aware of the findings in the periocular region, just like how you would notice the mild ptosis in this girl on the left side, which she thought was caused by the refractive surgeon. So the theme here is just quick tips on botulinum toxin fillers, blepharoplasty, and orbital surgery, but through a aesthetic uh, outlook. And I'll try to avoid the routine stuff that we would do. With Botox, we can use this either uh, as a simple wrinkle ironing method, or we can actually do facial contouring to change the shape of a structure, for example, the eyebrow. So chemical brow lift is where you try to depress the head of the brow and raise the tail end of the brow so as to create a more feminine shape as you can see here. So you're just trying to change the balance between two muscles to give a better look. Here is another example of the same. Going lower down in the face, a square face can be made more subtle and soft in the lower half by injecting Botox into the masseter. And here you can see the results of how the exact square appearance can be minimized by injecting the masseter muscle. 
gummy smile is a is a common cosmetic issue and the levator labi muscle the levator labi alicinaceae which is also injected for hemifacial spasms can be blocked by 2.5 units of botox to minimize the exposure of the gums during a wide smile talking about fillers uh, brow volume expansion is a very good uh, way of avoiding many of these subtle uh, excess skins in the upper eyelid which ideally you know you might erroneously feel that it needs a bleft but it actually can just be filled either with a filler or with fat to rebuild that volume and eliminate that extra fold which is appearing as there is loss of volume in that area so these are uh, photographs of patients whose volume in the brow has been built by a filler another example apart from that the temple was also filled here so that's the uh, filling in the temple region so that small little fold which otherwise you might think it needs a bleft is actually a volume issue uh, in the early phases and you can build volume by injecting into the brow tear trough is a very standard indication for uh, fillers in the lower eyelid something that ophthalmologists should be very comfortable in doing here are some of the examples of uh, fillers in the tear trough area and as you get more comfortable in the periocular region you can expand it for uh, non surgical rhinoplasty and even lip enhancements talking about bleph it's either upper or lower eyelid the upper eyelid is mostly skin plus or minus orbicularis and in lower eyelid it's either removal or rearrangement of fat as is deemed necessary the lower eyelid ones have obviously multiple options and choices and are more complex than the upper the upper one in addition can involve uh, removal of medial fat pad uh, sometimes you may have to fix the levator or even relax it based on the findings this uh, second picture shows how the lateral half of the orbic is removed in order to give a subtle lift to the tail end of the brow in patients with blepharocalesis you may have to simultaneously fix the lacrimal gland back into the uh, orbital rim area and of course uh, many patients will require a lateral canthoplasty or lcr along with that so here are examples of upper eyelid bleph here not necessarily skin was excised this was a young patient just to create a fold some amount of fat removal and deepening the crease these are cases of blepharocalesis where the extra skin was removed and middle aged patients for bleph double eyelid surgery again is a form of blepharoplasty in the upper eyelid to create a definite uh, fold lower eyelid bleph is a transconjunctival approach for most of us when the skin is not going to throw itself into excessive folds and these are examples of the same talking quickly about orbit of course we know that uh, decompression is uh, is predominantly done for cosmetic reasons in thyroid patients but it can also be done for unilateral high myopes as the left eye in this case along with lower eyelid retractor release and an extreme lateral tarsurophy here is a lady with a microphthalmic blind eye on the right side which had that slight enophthalmos and we treated her with autologous uh, intraorbital fat injections and you can see the result over a period of 1 year with the forward movement of the eyeball retroocular filler injection i have done it only in two seeing patients up till now it's more commonly done for anophthalmic uh, prosthesis which look enophthalmic but you can get a good result with that too and of course once you start doing the periocular and rest of the face you can go more extreme with the face and the neck thank you thank you dr milin we know it's a very vast subject and to cover it and summarize it in 10 minutes is actually basically giving you an introduction but at least you all get to know what all is possible being an ophthalmologist as well if you have the interest and the skills but skills are definitely important uh, these patients are highly demanding and they have a lot of expectations so do get proper experience and some training before you uh, jump into these procedures uh, thank you dr in the interest of time we will have to limit our discussion uh, as we are running slightly behind schedule so next i would like to invite dr usha kim ma'am 
she is head of department at Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai, and has a uh, decades of experience. I don't think uh, there is any condition under the sun in oculoplasty which she has not seen or not treated, and uh, uh, we'll all try to learn from her rich experience. Thank you, ma'am. She'll be talking about optic nerve fenestration. Am I audible? No. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Ma'am, can you press try? Ma'am, press, press once again, ma'am. Again, ma yes, Just say hello. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. So I'm just going to uh, take you through a story before I start off with uh, my actual procedure. This is the patient who is a 17-year-old with complaints of sudden loss of vision, which was painless, with restriction of lateral movements of both the eyes, which was for two days. And going into the past history, she had repeated headaches over a year. And neck stiffness with a little bit of pain and was treated as a case of migraine uh, and she said she had three episodes of headache during the week every week and the MRI of the brain on the previous day showed a normal study on general examination this patient was conscious oriented with a weight of about 79 kgs obviously obese and a blood pressure was 170 over 120 on ocular examination, her uh, uh, right eye showed a light perception with PR being inaccurate and left eye hand movements, dilated and fixed pupils with abduct uh, uh, abduction being restricted. So these two were the uh, important aspects. And on fundus examination, there was papilledema of both the eyes and uh, this was the picture that she had. The next day, there was right a lower motor neuron type of 7th nerve paresis, right proximal upper limb paresis, diminished plantar response and worsening of the next pain and the stiffness. And all her investigations were done and uh, the lumbar puncture had a CSF opening pressure of about 12 centimeters of water and the CSF analysis showed an increased protein. And the next MRI showed a dural venous sinus thrombosis. She was treated with three doses of IV mannitol and then she was also put on antihypertensive medications. And ATT was started empirically, but then it turned out that TB PCR was negative. At this point of time, her visual acuity was uh, hand movements on the right eye and 624 on the left eye. So we went. Uh, ahead with the scenario being hand movements 624 restricted abduction and sluggish pupils we went ahead and did an optic nerve sheath fenestration where we had to you know you have to disinsert the medial rectus muscle I hope no pediatrics ophthalmologists are there because this might sound a little crude but anyway, we were able to salvage the muscle at the end of the surgery. And uh, you have to expose the optic nerve, which is not very difficult. And what you need to do is, you can use an MVR blade, which you can borrow from your retinal surgeons, or even your paracentesis knife is good enough. And all you need to make is a nick on the uh, optic nerve sheath. And it's not just adequate to make just a nick. You have to make multiple windows. Earlier, they used to use myringotomy scissors, which I could not access. But then I tried to use the MVR blade and uh, continue making multiple slits and raise it a little bit to make a little bit of a window. So that's the uh, multiple slits that we are making on the nerve sheath. And once multiple slits are made, you can kind of roughly make a window and then you can reattach the uh, 
um, medial rectus muscle and close the conjunctiva. So the on day one post-op, she was 624 in the right eye, 69 in the left eye. And her uh, best correction turned to be 618 later. And there was improvement of uh, disc edema with the minimal pallor in the right eye. Her blood pressure came down to 150 over 90. So you can see the images, MRI images. There's a little bit of narrowing. I won't say a great deal, but then definitely the edema around the optic nerve has come down. So the fluid definitely has seeped out. And you can see the fundus picture. So a follow-up over 11 months showed a best corrected visual acuity, or, which has improved over a period of time to 6.9 in the right eye and 6.6 uh, six, six in the left eye with a peripheral constriction of fields. And this was what encouraged me to continue with the optic nerve sheath fenestrations over a period of time. It started from uh, um, 2011 and thanks to Firos and Dr. Partha and Dr. Marian for giving me the opportunity to present this. Now I have a good collection of cases. So surgical treatment of idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension the CSF diversion procedures that have been commonly adopted are ventriculoperitoneal or lumboperitoneal shunts, optic nerve sheath fenestration, and of course, the stenting and bariatric surgery, of course, to reduce the weight. But it was D. Wecker, just going back into history, he actually initiated the treatment of papal edema by performing the optic nerve sheath decompression using a very peculiar instrument which Without any visualization, he uh, performed the uh, uh, procedure. And it was Heere who artificially produced papal edema in animal model and demonstrated that creating a window produces bilateral relief of optic disc edema. So, in fact, the mechanism here would be obliteration of the subarachnoid space surrounding the optic nerve by the fibroblast proliferation, preventing the CSF pressure transmission distilled to the operative site, creation of a dural fistula which allows the egress of opt these uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So indications for optic nerve sheath fenestration has to be very very clear. It has to be progressive loss of vision and pa papal edema that is refractory to medical therapy. So you have a lateral approach, you can use a lateral orbitotomy method or uh, either by removing the bony flap or without removing the bony flap or a medial approach which could be medial transconjunctival or a superior lit crease approach. It's performed under general anesthesia. Definitely a high risk consent has to be obtained. And with patients who are under anticoagulants, you'll have to uh, stop the anticoagulants and then proceed with the procedure. And of course, you have to give them a guarded visual prognosis. The lit crease approach Again, it's a, a, a procedure that can be adopted in case of an, a lean individual. It's not for a patient who is obese because the fat is definitely going to come in the way and you're not a, definitely uh, you will not be able to approach the optic nerve that easily. So I choose these patients. If you notice, this uh, individual was a little thin. You can make out even on the, uh, the lid with the lids and then you enter, you reach the optic nerve and make the opening in the optic nerve and then you, you can see the fluid seeping out. Sometimes you can get a very, very little egress but then eventually when you keep pressing over the area, you will see the seepage and it's as simple as that. And this, again, I modified a lit little bit where you don't have to do a complete peritomy. You just have to make a small nick over the medial rectus and you can perform the procedure quite comfortably. And over a period of time, you will become a good squint surgeon as well. And you can see the good egress of the fluid.
again as i mentioned you need not have to go and search for the uh, uh, knives you can either use the paracentesis which you use for the cataract surgery or you can get the mvr blade from the so after the initial poke the uh, sheath actually goes and collapses so you'll have to be very careful about picking it up and making the multiple slits and you can suture the conjunctiva over it or you can even use a glue so patients who fail conservative uh, treatment like weight loss and maximal medical therapy for papilledema this is a good procedure uh, the it is it has to be done particularly when there is a visual compromise and uh, the peritoneal shunts have to be used for uh, patients with headache so you'll have to consciously and carefully pick out the patients um, now our experience out of the 99 patients vision improved in 46 more than two lines improved in 19 vision remained same in about 38 vision did worsen in about 15 patient where in 15 patient, patients and ipsilateral improvement in vision was there in 27.3% bilateral improvement in 20% and contralateral improvement in 9% so there is a significant improvement in patients and i think it's good to advocate this procedure and uh, it's the good prognosis is seen in patients with good uh, presenting visual equity which means you will have to catch these patients earlier which means we'll have to talk to the neurologist as well because most often it's the neurologist who comes across these patients even though it's a visual loss which uh, uh, happens first and shorter time to intervention is what matters and unilateral surgery did have a good prognosis for the other eye as well and acute visual loss has a better prognosis and it did corroborate with the retrospective studies that were done earlier wherein a seven year retrospective study of visual outcomes was done in a tertiary center 31 eyes out of 14 patients visual equity improved in 24 remained stable in 62 percent uh, worsen in about 13 uh, percent of the patients and uh, visual fields which were reliable only in 48 uh, percent of the operated eyes and four of the patients required a CSF diversion procedure they concluded that ONSF predominantly stabilizes visual function and patients whose visual function deteriorated despite maximal medical and surgical treatment were often those with late presentation or delayed diagnosis which I thought I completely agreed with the kind of uh, patients that I saw. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, ma'am. Thank uh, you so much. the interest yeah. of time, I think we'll limit the questions and we'll uh, catch hold of ma'am outside yeah. once we are done. We'll go to the next speaker. We'll go to uh, Dr. Saptagiri Shambhatla to speak about corneal neurotization, a new procedure that come up in neurotrophic keratitis. Thank you, Dr. Fairuz. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about corneal neurotization. And uh, this technique is very much borrowed from the facial neurotization technique, which is done by most of the ENT surgeons and also the ocular facial surgeons. So just a small slide about understanding what the anatomy is that we are concerned. We have the corneal stroma, we have the stromal subepithelial plexus from where the nerves, the subbasal nerves enter, turn in anterior through the basal lamina. And then you have the intraepithelial terminals which come and lie just below the corneal epithelium. And these are the ones which are the most sensitive for which all the corneal sensations are perceived. And to understand that there are close to about 7,000 no uh, nociceptors per square millimeter which serve both sensory and trophic functions. We all read about that there's a reflex arc which starts from the cornea, which is mostly responsible for the blinking. But what we don't know is that there's also an autonomic arc which regulates the secretion of goblet cells and lacrimal and meibomian gland functions. And this is very important in patients with neurotrophic keratitis because a blinking can still be there in patients who have lost corneal sensation, but they lose their ability to form tears because this autonomic arc is completely gone. 
So the common cause of anesthesia is congenital corneal anesthesia, then you have herpetic eye diseases, diabetic neuropathy, trauma, and post corneal surgeries like keratoplasties and LASIK. And the main aim is to treat the cause. Uh, there's a classification, it's called the McKinsey's classification for neurotrophic keratitis. You put them in that, and that gives you the nomogram as to how you manage stage one, stage two, stage three, or grade one, grade two, grade three. So basically you treat the cause, control the inflammation, optimize the ocular surface with lubricants, promote epithelial healing, like doing a tarsorophies and prevent further progression of the disease. You can do minor procedures like punctal plugs, tarsorophies, Botox, no, no affiliation to Botox though, but, and you can use glue. Or you can carry the, and you carry the lid deformities, manage trichiasis, do temporary tarsorophies, permanent tarsorophies, injection, Botox injections again. Surgeries like Gunderson flap, using amniotic membranes, or even doing uh, keratoplasties. Of course, these come under high risk uh, keratoplasties because they have a high rate of failure. But still, it is a potentially blinding disease. It progresses in spite of all interventions. And when standard treatments are ineffective, especially when you know it's going to grade three, uh, we can use advan advances in the neurotization technique and uh, we can go and do a nerve transfer. So I'll describe the technique that I have been doing where I've harvested the uh, sural nerve. So it's important to understand how the nerve plexus in the cornea is. So you have stromal nerve trunks, which are very thick and they lie along the limbus. And from where you have subbasal hairpin-like nerves, which come and they flood the entire cornea, right? Which is more in the central area. That's where the central part is much more sensitive than the periphery. And clinical studies have shown that uh, they do regenerate, but following any injury, they never come back to their pre-surgical or pre-injury levels. And following a procedure like LASIK, they come down to about 20, 82%. Uh, and it takes almost about two years for them to come even up to 60% of the preoperative values. So the amount of anesthesia that happens uh, following any uh, surgery on the cornea is quite significant. So Tursis uh, and all described this technique way back in 2009, where they did a direct transfer the contralateral supratrochlear and the supraorbital nerves to the cornea. And it was further modified by Baines and at all who used in 2015 publication where they used the nerves into the cornea. So I'll just describe how we did it. We used the uh, sural nerve, which is a sensory nerve located in the calf region, which extends from the mid calf to the ankle, located laterally. And it, it transmits sensations from the lateral part of the leg. And uh, this is how the nerve looks. Can I have a pointer, please, for me? OK. And we take a large segment, at least about 15 centimeters. And this is the, this is the first surgery that we did. So I took subrow incisions just on, on the uh, supraorbital notch. And, uh, but later on, the further surgeries we modified by taking a lid crease incision so that it is cosmetically more acceptable and you can also do play around with any amount of uh, small bliff, bliff or something if you need to. Uh, then you isolate the supraorbital nerve and then you take the nerve graft that you harvested, you pass it through a subrow tunnel, either from the ipsilateral side or the contralateral side and you open up the nerve fascicles, which is there in the nerve. It's just like, as uh, Dr. Sunil Morekar would tell, that it's like opening the wire of your iPod charger, and then you find the fine fiber, the fine wires, it's like that. Uh, not so simple though, but. And uh, this is a short video which shows the surgical technique. So just trying to show that he had, this boy has sensation of all, all around the face. Uh, yeah, this was done on the table. And the left eye is the iron problem. So we harvested the graph. It's a fairly simple procedure. Um, so you take the incisions, um, skin, subcutaneous tissue, separate the amount of fat which is there. Immediately you find the vein and the artery. And along with that, you'll find the sural nerve. And it sort of love uh, the it's it's fairly thin to start with, but as you as it goes superiorly, it tends to go more posterior, and more and more nerves t 
tend to join it and becomes more thicker. So you take a large fragment, uh, as much as you'd want it, and uh, I think about 10 to 15 centimeters is what you'd want, depending on the size of the face. And it has to be preserved in cold saline. And here, this, this was the first case which we did. So I used a sub-row incision just to access the supraorbital nerve. Uh, it's difficult to find the supraorbital nerve at times. And uh, it, you don't find the supraorbital nerve when you want to search for it. It comes in times and you don't search for it. Like excentration is always the first to get cut. And then you open up all the fibrils of the uh, sural nerve. And then you make pockets. Uh, subcongenital pockets, and then you anchor these fascicles into the pockets such that they face the limbus. So the closer you are to the limbus, the better is the, the factors which stimulate the existing nerves to start budding back again. So basically what this nerve will do is it will provide the chemical stimulus for the existing nerves to start budding again and grow back again. It's not that these nerves will actually go into the cornea per se. So the, the existing cornea needs a stimulus to grow back. That's the autonomic arc which I was talking about. So we made a, a scleral tunnel and then brought the nerve from there and anchored it subconjunctively very close to the limbus. So this was the very first surgery which I did. Of course, now I don't perform it this way. We highly modified it. We make a corneoscleral pocket and we put the nerve into that corneoscleral pocket and suture it with the tensile nylon, so it's at the limbus inside. So what we found is that the nerves grow much faster, the recovery is much faster, and uh, the patients don't have that bulk around the uh, limbus, because the bulk around the limbus causes a delin, and they have severe dry eyes, and they get compli com compliant. Of course, they don't feel anything because it takes some time for the nerves to grow and bud and some sensations or some corneal stability to happen. And once the nerve is placed, you just have to close the conjunctival opening, which I did in the phonics to open it up. But now we just make a window to let it come out. And the uh, proximal end, the, here I'm doing a side to end anastomosis. It's a typical uh, hollow vessel anastomosis, the way you do it. Uh, I did it with a 10 0 nylon, but you can also use 8 0 nylon to do the anastomosis. And it's important that the perineurium is opened up of the supraorbital nerve, otherwise the connection is not going to take place. Because the proximal end anyway, the perineurium is opened, but you have to open the perineurium of the supraorbital nerve. You can either use the supraorbital or the supratrochlear also if you can get it. Supraorbital is much more thicker and it's much more easier to identify and also do an anastomosis. And once you do that, you open the guide suture and then close the wound. So fairly simple surgery, uh, just takes a little time because we're not used to the anatomy of the leg and others, but uh, not so difficult. And this was the patient, uh, day one. This was the surgery pre -op. He had to do a DAC because he was a pediatric patient. So he had a DAG done because of the risk of amblyopia, which would set in. Otherwise, we would prefer to do the neurotization first, have some sensation in the cornea, and then do the corneal procedures. But it's a small child, so the risk of amblyopia was increasing, and he, the vision was decreasing. So the pediatric ophthalmologist suggested we do a simultaneous surgery, and that's what we did. That was on day one. And this, after about uh, four months, when he came back, um, Yes, it's not the ideal way to test the sensation. I would have wanted to use anesthesiometer. Uh, we did not have anesthesiometer at that time. So just a rough way of checking that he has some, some amount of sensation he was having. So uh, we did, until date, about nine eyes of eight patients. I think I've run out of time. I'm sorry. I'll just summarize. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, we did about nine eyes of eight patients. and. Uh, there are various levels of follow-up. The, the first follow-up is almost about 28 months now. So what we have found over time is that when we did uh, four fascicles, uh, the recovery was lower than the five fascicles which we did. So the more fascicles you do, the more is the connection to the cornea. And what we found is that when we started moving to corneoscleral pockets, 
the rate of recovery is faster. It, the ultimate rate will be the same, but re rate of recovery is faster in them. And uh, um, I, I have some pictures which show the uh, late follow-up uh, status, but in the interest of time, in closing it. And how we have moved now is, and in, in, after 12 months, we've seen some sub-basal nerves grow into the graft itself, which is a very fantastic phenomenon. The future modifications, what we are looking at is wrapping these nerves in PTFE sheets, which we use for frontalis sling. The reason being that what the facial nerves uh, neurosurgeons have suggested is that when you do a corneal neurotization or neuro any neurotization, at the proximal and distal end, the nerve is secured. The connections are intact. But in the path that is happening, you can have some fibrotic changes happening and that can press the nerve. And that you have no control. So one suggestion was maybe you can use something which will insulate that particular nerve like a wire. So one option we were looking at is either wrap it in fascia lata or use a PTFE sheet to do it. But the problem is we have to have some uh, nerve physiologists tell us that you no know, blood supply will not be compromised. Dr. Saptagirish, I'm really I'm, sorry to I'm interrupt you. So Thank you sorry. very much. And but we'll have college, this interesting Dr. discussion. Sunil and Dr. Pallin, who's <laughs> been a corner surgeon, motivated for us. Thank yeah, you. we'll have Thank this you. discussion at the tea, yeah, outside. All of us will be available for some more time. Dr. Santosh Onava, as the next speaker on ocular oncology, what are the advances? Over to you, sir. Good morning. Thank you for Firoz uh, for putting this course together. I'll be talking briefly on targeted targeted therapy in ocular oncology. That's the a uh, new paradigm shift in the management of several of tumors that we are used to. This is one size fits all medicine that we are generally used to where a particular drug is given to all the patients. We expect that this drug works in all the patient, but that doesn't really happen. Stratified medicine is one when the patient is grouped into several subtypes, disease subtypes, demographics, clinical features and biomarkers. Whereas when you use biomarkers specifically, then that becomes precision medicine. These are several types of cancer treatment that we are aware of. In ocular oncology, we use two types of target therapy. One is called targeted therapy, where we target the molecules. The second is organ-targeted tumor-specific drug delivery, I being an isolated organ and the orbit also relatively isolated from rest of the systemic uh, issues, can be targeted with several drugs by means of injections. What exactly is targeted therapy? It targets specific genes and proteins in cancer cells that help them grow, divide and spread. This is the differences between chemotherapy, targeted therapy and immunotherapy. Chemotherapy targets all the rapidly dividing cells. That results in several complications and also has several limitations. Whereas targeted therapy targets proteins required for the cancer growth. It does have complications but not as many as those that we see in chemotherapy. I don't have time to explain the potential targets and potential derivables. This is a difficult slide to explain in the given time. But the aims of targeted therapy are curative. Of course, you want to cure the cancer. That is one. New adjuvant, when you use these to reduce the size of the tumor so that you can do further treatment as appropriate. Adjuvant, after you have done surgery, if you have a patient who has a high risk of metastasis or local tumor recurrence, you can use it. Palliative, when you want to prolong life. Now, before the target therapy is even thought of, the first step is to identify molecular profile and so that you can identify the target. For each of these tumors, basal cell carcinoma, we have hedgehog pathway. Squamous cell carcinoma, we have EGFR and PD-1 and PDL one For melanoma, it's very much worked out. BRA, BRAF, PD-1, PDL one and ctla 4 Sebaceous gland carcinoma, things are being worked out. Merkel cell carcinoma, we already have the things sorted out. So once we have the mutational spectrum all worked out, the next step is to identify the drug. Now, if you are a novice in uh, using these medications, you go by the last two or three letters of these drugs. When, whenever it ends with IB, it's a small molecule drug. Example, Vismodegib. Whenever it ends with MAB or MAB, it's a monoclonal antibody. So MAB example is Ranubizumab. Now, small molecules actually make a big difference. 
In basal cell carcinoma, these are being extensively used. It's also being used in squamous cell carcinoma. In basal cell carcinoma, we go by the hedgehog pathway inhibitors. Erivage or vismotigib or sonidigib are used in basal cell carcinoma. Initially started off with syndromic variant of basal cell carcinoma called the Golingol syndrome, where patients develop multiple basal cell carcinomas on the face and exposed areas of the body. That can be treated with this capsule, vismotigib. It is a lifelong treatment. Once we stop this medication, the patients pop back with tumors can also be used for orbital invasion of basal cell carcinoma. Like this patient who was inoperable, this is from the literature, where this drug was used to reduce the size of the tumor and keep the patient comfortable as long as he was alive. This is again from Ismaili's group. But this patient had wet ARMD in the right eye, had no vision. In the left eye, cornea and pupillary axis was obscured by a tumor which was in the inferior inferolateral orbit. This patient was inoperable. Again, for that patient, they used erlotinib, which is easily available in India. It reduced the volume of the tumor and thus brought the eye back and the patient was able to see with the left eye. So it was a palliative treatment Well, worked well for the patient because the patient was mobile until he was alive. In sebaceous gland carcinoma, we can use several chemotherapeutic drugs to reduce the volume of the tumor. This was easily exenterable. That is the, how the patient presented to us. You can see after first cycle of chemotherapy, the tumor volume has substantially reduced. After three cycles, it reduced to the extent that we can do a surgery. That's again a form of targeted therapy. This was a patient with sebaceous gland carcinoma in an unusual location, lacrimal sac. Somebody had done a DCR and it's gone to the nose. Patient had 6-6 and 6 vision. There again, we use this form of treatment. You can see that after dacrocystectomy and radiation, the patient is absolutely fine. In um, uh, but This particular drug can be used in uh, orbital edhem chester disease. This is vimurafenib. And this was a patient where there was thyroid eye disease with IgG4 overlay. So there are some patients with thyroid eye disease currently we have identified have an IgG4 overlay where the therapy is very difficult. He settled down with rituximab but soon recurred, not very keen on giving radiation to this young patient. So started this patient on bortezomib and he settled down and he has settled down and he's remaining so for about 18 months. In neurofibroma, who would expect that target therapies work? But actually now there are many forms of target therapies in plexiform neurofibroma and also optic nerve glioma. Monoclonal antibodies are being used in uh, management of lymphoma. We are aware of rituximab and its beneficial effects. We are also aware of pembrolizumab, which is published in the literature, which is used for conjunctival melanoma with orbital extension. This is the re report on nivolumab. This is my own experience with nivolumab. This patient had regional lymph node metastasis, for which he got approval from the insurance for nivolumab as a systemic treatment. He also had conjunctival PAM with extensive melanoma, that was a conjunctival PAM with melanoma that he had at the initial manifestation, which completely regressed when he started using nivolumab for regional lymph node metastasis, thus making it a case for possible treatment choice for primary conjunctival melanoma. In UL melanoma, we have worked out the mutational spectrum and the target, target therapeutic agents. There are many studies underway as an adjuvant treatment in patients with uveal melanoma to reduce the risk of systemic metastasis. In organ-targeted tumor-specific drug delivery, we have many drugs. We can use pisibanil and bleomycin in lymphangioma. We can use corticosteroids such as Tramslone in patients with eosinophilic granuloma where bone completely remodels over time without needing any major surgery. We also have intralesional injection of bevacizumab for orbital cavernous hemangioma, which is located in the orbital apex. This is a report from the literature which shows reduction in tumor size and also consequent benefit in terms of visual field deficit. This is a patient with benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia treated with bevacizumab injection. You can see very good response in this patient reported in the literature. Benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia treated with rituximab with reduction in tumor volume. This is our own patient with uh, conjunctival lymphoma, but with posterior extension. This part is difficult to get. Obviously, anterior part is easy to excise. For the posterior residual extent, you can use low-dose radiation. But short of it, we can give in perilesional rituximab, six injections, three weekly apart, and this patient was rid of this residual tumor. So there are several flip sides of targeted therapy as well. There are side effects and resistances. There are some unknown side effects which may come up over a period of time. Price is definitely a limiting factor. I described two ways of delivering target therapy. One is systemic, second is organ-specific tumor-oriented. But definitely these drugs have their, put their foot in the door and they are likely to come in a very big way in the near future. Thank you so much.
uh, now we'll just move to the surgical part of orbit i invite dr kasturi to speak about the recent advances thank you ferus for this opportunity so i'll be going very fast i think we hardly have 15 minutes so i'll try to cover everything very very fast so that i can finish it within 5 minutes so is this working yeah so i'll be speaking on advances in the orbit surgery dr ganga has i mean included quite a lot of it so i believe for the orbit we really need technological advances and i feel that this technology plays a very important role especially in impure fracture with ganga has already mentioned where is the raised fracture of the wall the fracture of the rim and also in more challenging situation where you have a zmc fracture and also the fracture of the face the leford 1 2 and 3 and the noe fracture which also have been mentioned which may be associated with the cantal dystopia depending upon the type of the anoe fracture and the orbital apex fracture and more important is that when you have a bad blob subluxation whether it can be subluxated superiorly inferiorly or medially so one of the most advanced technology that we all are using nowadays most of us are using here is the navigation which basically acts as a gps and which really gives you the road map to the surgery so i'll not go much into details but one of the advantage of this navigation is that you can do a mirroring you can go for segmentation segmentation of both the soft tissue and also bony segmentation with the mirroring really helps us how much amount of the volume loss how much amount of the inophthalmos and also it helps to identify the defect quantify the displacement and go for the patient specific implant so it is very useful when there is a unilateral condition when say unilateral fracture where you mirror the normal over the normal and you measure the approximately amount of the orbital expansion that is the amount of inophthalmos that has been created and once this has been created then you do go ahead with the surgery and you can really design the implant very well you can also pre i mean pre, um, plan up the surgery what is the thickness of the implant you want whether you just want a titanium or you want a more thicker mtb or mt1 and once this is being done you find a very good adequate correction as you can see here the pre and the post of some of the challenging situation you can see like when you have such a bad fracture and you go for the titanium place and the titanium screw and also with an adequate correction as you can see here post operatively following the surgical procedure so this is a case of bad noe that you can see the fracture the medial wall in fewer wall a mirroring has been done the surgery has been conducted along with the repair of the medial canthus and you can see the one year the post operatively follow up is adequately good However, what is the most common indication for me is when we go for the surgery of the optic canal. When this is a really challenging part, especially when you look at the canal, not only to the canal. If you you should know where the superior orbital fissure is, where also the canal is, because just inferior lateral you have the carotid artery. So this is very challenging, and I feel anyone doing the surgery without a precise guidance, it should not be done because of uh, you have real important vital structure. So this is a patient where you can see the bony segment in. pinching of the optic nerve this is the situation where you need some guidance and then as you go ahead with the surgery following the registration and then once you go deeper and you expose the optic canal and then this uh, system really tells you where is the end point of the surgery how much far you need to go and now you have a much modern modification you have a endoscope along with it which is a virtual endoscope so this really guides you in the system where which part of the uh, i mean orbital apex you have reached why i insist in the uh, i mean navigation system like you see when i was doing this surgery and it every time i was putting the stylet you can see it is going to the sphenoid sinus so it has guided me that i am not in the correct pathway so then i realized that my decompression is not very complete so i have further gone for and i have further gone ahead and done the further decompression and then now if you look to the stylet here it goes right in the canal from the orbital end to the cranial end so this is what it guides you and if i do a little deviation from my the i mean the pathway the cylinder that i have created, it it can lead to some very serious consequences and the results are amazingly good like we have done more than 80 number of patient and where we have found and very recently we have sent a large series for publication and also not even this is sometimes to remove also the embedded the i mean the uh, foreign body which is deep within the orbit it really helps next a technological advances is the 3d printing here especially when you have a bilateral fracture then the navigation mirroring will not work in such situation the 3d 
printing really helps you to go for a good adequate correction not only for this uh, fracture and also for the bad contracted socket where exactly you can measure on how much amount of volume deficit is that how you go ahead with the surgery and these are some of the uh, real useful situation where the technology really helps us to go for an adequate correction of this um, i mean complicated cases and and here also i'd like to show some other cases where the technology really helps us one is a patient specific implant and this patient i'm really going very fast here to the i mean paucity of time this patient specific implant which i think many of us are doing it is really a lock and key fit it really gives you how much amount of expansion how much amount of volume correction you need to do and i feel this is something new which has really helped us do a much better correction following a fracture repair so this is what i want to show like when we all started the orbital decompression for the thyroid disease we know that in the thyroid the fat is very sticky it is not so easy to remove the fat though it is easy to remove the bone but what i have realized by using another technological advances which is known as a qsa you can really remove the uh, fat very well where you have a soft tissue component where the fat gets aspirated so well if you look over here like you, if you look here look at the, the tubing here you can see that is a fat how beautifully the fat gets aspirated especially in the medial wall we do not want to go too much of bony decompression because sometimes it might lead to postoperative diplopia and we get very good result but more than that this i mean technological advance i feel especially the qsa the control ultrasound suc uh, suction aspirator it really helps in those inflamed cases like this is one of the case where i was doing a medial decompression without removing the uh, bony wall and and i can feel the expression of the fat is pretty well and it gives a very adequate correction following the surgical procedure what i want to show here is especially in situation where you have a very very active disease like this when she is not responding i don't know for the last few months i'm seeing many patient who is not responding to steroid not responding to rituximab not responding to tocilizumab so these are the situation you have to take up for a uh, uh, decompression and it is really difficult to do decompression here you really need the help of the Technology. At least you can salvage the vision and give some amount of correction. Another gentleman with a bad thyroid disease, a chronic smoker, and this is the last patient which I want to show. This is a case of glioma, as you can see here, very characteristic in the MRI feature in both the T1 and the T2. Only child of the parent who never wanted uh, the eye to be removed or they wanted that some amount of vision to be retained. So this where I have used it, the QSA, and following the removal of the orbital bone, this is a QSA that has. Been been used and you can see a uh, aspiration uh, of the tumor and this is the child post operative what really helped me is this now she is under carboplatin and then you can see you can also retain the eye and also remove maximum amount of the tumor so with this i conclude thank you very much for your patient hearing thank you ma'am uh, thank you and thanks for speeding it up we are really short of time lastly dr fairuz we don't have time that's fine. we have to have <laughs> Yeah, you can maybe just in, finish yeah. Finish. yeah quickly we'd like to listen what uh, you have to three tell minutes us. okay We have. Really quick one, okay? So, uh, what I'm talking to you uh, today is minimally invasive orbital surgery. So, I have no financial disclosures. We have to, uh, we have seen about microinvasive ophthalmic surgery like cataract surgeries, vitreous surgeries, and orbitotomy also is something where you have enough approach from various corners. It could be medial, lateral, superior, inferior. But taking care of the vital structures, we all know that we have so many vital structures in the orbit. Now, this has been the history from 1888. You know where a large incision has been thought about then they went to the lateral approach the bone was removed and various 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 incision has been uh, so a uh, various surgical uh, speciality has been spe uh, speaking about minimally invasive approaches and well why not orbit and yes we 
have advanced uh, so far so minimal invasive orbital surgeries that's what i'm going to speak about the surgical approaches of course we have non surgical approaches which is very very minimalistic you're just going in with a needle and treating you know big lymph and you know lymphatic malformations and even varics but then we are going to speak about the uh, i'll just show you one video over here where a large uh, lacrimal gland tumor in fact you know i call i call it a a, a golf ball tumor a golf ball is foot 40 mm this was around 44 mm initially it would have been done with you know a bone removal and a large uh, stellar dried incision so this is a very cosmetic approach of a lid crease uh, which is done over here Uh, and i think i'll be having time only to show this video I have few more videos for you so it's a subcutaneous dissection done and uh, you know you approach the periosteum this is layer by layer approach and this is where uh, the periosteum is cut as you can see here in the superior orbital uh, 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 wall and then you actually dissect it and then you reach the periorbita um i'm running it through faster 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 and after you reach the periorbita the periorbita is uh, you know um, incised and we, with very very gentle uh, this is like a baby coming out and it was very difficult so in fact a little bit of punching of the bone superior which is very very sharp was done and a large tumor was delivered uh, so this is how even without a large skin incision or even without a bone removal and orbital tumor can be removed and this was how big the tumor was it was almost 45 mm and then you uh, suture it so um uh, well another uh, patient over here a medial lesion which is around 25 to 30 mm in fact this uh, i have a video here but okay uh, this is supramedial orbitotomy and this was done under local anesthesia so we have been minimalistic in the surgic surgical approach and also minimalistic in you know even anesthesia so this was how uh, and it was very minimal in fact you know a medial uh, lid crease incision was done in this patient and this is how the tumor was uh, taken out yeah one second sorry yeah now pediatric orbitotomy is difficult we know that anatomically it is small and limited orbital space but still with you know this is a transconjunctival approach with a large tumor sitting in over there which was actually wrapping around optic nerve so the extraconal and intraconal approach was good enough for this patient and this was how the tumor was even with a bony component transconjunctival approach and this is no scar absolutely you know you can call it a scarless surgery uh, so uh, inferior transconjunctival orbitotomy is done for most of the intra coronal lesions now this is a dumbbell dermoid in this patient so what i did was in this patient was uh, a a a transcarinkular lateral uh, canthal incision in fact you know i didn't even incise the skin so just went through took a bore and the orbital component that uh, you know the dumbbell component in the temporal fossa was also with the bore made a hole and aspirated the lesion over there aspirated the lesion over here and uh, this is how he was treated and this is how post operatively he looks like absolutely no scar no lid crease nothing just the trans uh, uh, canthal approach so uh, i would conclude that less is mostly more and we have gotten to a very very minimize, minimally invasive approach to the orbit thank you so much for your patient listening i actually took out the video of the trans canthal i'll show you sometimes later thank you fairuz yeah. uh, brilliant video and great results thank as you. always thank yeah. you and thank you all the people who uh, listened to all these talks and thanks to all the speakers for giving us immense knowledge in a limited time thank you so much thank you it's an honor to have all of you here together in this national symposium and aios scientific committee is also extremely grateful for all of you having here thank you